Yeah. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of EOS and the Sentence. It's 1090J. Y'all already know that. Man, listen, today, um, I told y'all on the last one, I gave y'all a heads up, you know, this video is just, when I said I could have handled something a lot better, in this video, I really didn't. And I don't want y'all to focus on that. I want y'all to focus on what there is to learn from this video. So I want to bring this up beforehand. You know what I mean? I don't want people coming on this um, this channel thinking that this is about prison glorification, that game banging is cool, that game banging is the thing to do. That's not what I'm saying whatsoever. And that's not the reason I'm here presenting you guys, you know, with these stories. The reason that I'm doing this is more or less when I was growing up when I was younger, when I was a teenager, I just feel that, you know, when adults would speak to me and adults would forewarn me on what was to come if I keep going down the direction I'm going, I feel like it was too PG-13. I honestly feel like, you know, they, they say, oh, prison rape and prison stabbings and things like that, but it just didn't click to me. It wasn't enough to prevent anything for me i just i didn't think it was that serious i was already you know subjected to a level of violence on the street so i was already seeing other things and you know if someone's telling you prison is bad but at the same time you're telling them your neighborhood is worse it's just it wasn't connected for me so i try to be as brutally honest as i can but i try to at the same time be appropriate for all ages. So this isn't just an adult channel. You can show, you know, an at-risk youth these videos and hopefully they're able to relate, hopefully they're able to connect and hopefully they're able to learn and prevent themselves or others from going down the same route. You know what I mean? So with that being said, let's get into it. I'm taking you out of the Lancaster work camp in my part one, uh, on lockdown 2301, Death asked me what was the craziest thing I saw at the Lancaster facility. The craziest thing I saw at the Lancaster facility wasn't on the main unit. It was at the work camp. So there was plenty of things that happened at the main unit. I just didn't get to witness it. Like there was one time when a CO, they would have riot cans of gas. It almost looks like a, a gallon attached with a handle. And it would just be straight gas and they would spray you with it. And, you know, this is more or less that there's a big riot and um, a tank of gas actually blew up on a CO and the tank went flying in the air and landed like, you know, a hundred yards in another direction. And the CO was completely covered in this gas. You know what I mean? I think it's common because he used to love spraying people, but there was a lot of wild things that happened at Lancaster. I just didn't get to witness that in particular. And one thing that I feel a lot of people can learn from is this kid from Broward County. Uh, he, we were in our dorm at the Lancaster work camp. So this is the 18 to 19 year old dorm. So we are the youngest ones at the dorm with the least mature compared to everyone else. Generally in prison, wherever you have the younger guys is where there's gonna be the more violence, the more trying to prove yourself, you know, that's just how it goes in there. And with this particular kid, he wasn't gang affiliated. He was Haitian though. So there's a difference between being Haitian and being a Zo. You know, you'll hear a lot of Haitians that say Zo and Zo Pound was a gang that formed in Southern Florida. You know what I mean? I'm not gonna get too into their stuff because I don't feel I'm educated enough to speak on it. I wouldn't want to say anything that isn't 110%. But from what I know, Zopound is older guys. I've never met anyone under the age of 35 claiming to be Zopound. ZMF, Zo Mafia Family, is the newest thing that's, you know, floating around. That would be like, you know, I don't want to name names, but... If you hear Zo nowadays, they're talking about ZMF. They're not talking about Zo Pound. And that's mainly what was at Lancaster as far as the Haitian gangs go. 
So he was Haitian, but he wasn't ZMF. He wasn't claiming to be a Zoe. But he wanted to get down with them. And I mean, the guy, he was about like 6'1". You know, he was a little bit tall. And he had gotten into a fight with someone that was actually under extortion. So if you're getting extorted in, you know, Florida State Prison, they got nicknames for it. They'll call you a jizzle. A jizzle is just someone who who broke it off. You know, you're paying for protection or you're paying to stay in that dorm. And he got into an argument with the jizzle who wasn't going to take it, at least not from him. He didn't, he wasn't scared of him in particular. They fought and the Haitian kid, you know, he didn't win. And it was a really, really bad look, especially um, from everybody that was from where he was from. They're all looking at him like, you lost to a jizzle? Like, what is this? And you were trying to get down with us? There was a lot of Zoles over there. There was a couple of them I respected, you know what I mean? When you have enemies, we beef with Zoles mainly more than anyone. But if you're truly at war and you're truly facing, you know, an enemy that's on the level that you're on, y'all will have some type of mutual respect because you don't get respect going to war with people that aren't about it, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? When you see, you know, superstar athletes, they're on a superstar tier and so is their opponent. And it's the same thing in prison. If you're on that level and you're beefing with people on that level, y'all will have a mutual respect because y'all have done the same things to get to that level. And if you're beefing with people that aren't on your level, it's never a good look because it's just like you're picking on the weaker ones. You know what I mean? So, I mean, there were some real zoes, you know, in the dorm and on the compound. And this is at the work camp. So this is the smaller compound. So what ended up happening with this kid is he was just dying to be affiliated with them, but he was friendly with everyone. And what's messed up about it is if you met him on the street, he just, he doesn't seem like a bad kid. You know what I mean? Friendly, you know, he, he wasn't scarred up and looking crazy like we were. He had all his teeth. He looked like he came from a good home. And had a good upbringing. Um, I believe he graduated high school. He just, he wasn't really a bad kid. I believe he was just a kid that made a mistake. Peer pressure in prison is real, though. When a lot of people want to group up, a lot of people want to click up. Not just out of fear, though. It's like, you know, when you got a group of friends, it's a good feeling. Versus being by yourself and not having anybody on your side or anybody that you affiliate with. It's always, you know, we're social beings, bro. We're not meant to be by ourselves. That's why when you go to confinement, you go crazy, especially if you're in there by yourself. Um, he just wanted to fit in more or less. And I feel that a lot of people that have joined gangs, me included, at some point we all want to fit in. You know what I mean? Everybody wants to fit into something. We all want to be a part of something. It doesn't need to be gang banging. It could be a sports team. It could be whatever. It's just, it's always a, a good feeling to be accepted. And I feel like that's what this kid was looking for. And I really hope that you guys can pay attention to this. You know what I mean? Because I know there's a lot of people that will view things and be like, oh, look at, look at Jake. He's game banging and now he's on YouTube. That's not the message I'm trying to project. The message I'm trying to project is what's to come. So... What happens in the state of Florida is if you have an open case or if you have a new case while you're in prison, let's say you're in prison and you did a burglary or a shooting, but at that time, they didn't have any evidence to give you charges for what you did. So you're already in prison. For whatever reason it was, I don't know his particular case, but he had a new case come up and he had to go back to court. So he ended up going back down to the Broward County Court, you know, so he gets transferred from the state prison back to court. Certain amount of time goes by, you know, it, it really wasn't that long, maybe a few weeks. And he comes back, comes back to the work camp, comes back to the same dorm. All of a sudden, he's ZMF. 
full-blown ZMF, saying he's so everything. So everyone's kind of, even me, knowing that I'm not even affiliated with them, I'm like, what? This doesn't even sound right. Like, how? What he said is when he went to the courthouse, he met up with someone who is very high ranked in that particular group. And that person brought him in. Little did he know that there was someone in another dorm who was very close with that same person. And he made a phone call that night. When you false claim to be something, this can be very dangerous. You know, there's a lot of people that will have that fake it till you make it attitude. In prison, it doesn't last long especially when you're around authentic people, people that can really figure out who you know, how you know them, when you met them, what is the status of y'all's relationship? You know what I mean? They're doing background checks. We want to figure out everything about you. We want to know your history. We're pulling up all your receipts. What happened is that guy made that call. I believe this was the next day, the very next day. And we were all out on the rec yard. What ended up happening was there was a smaller Haitian, you know, individual. Wasn't as big as the kid from Broward who was saying he's a zone now. And he jumped on his back. He jumped on his back with a box cutter and cut him all the way to behind his head. Another individual jumped in and picked him up and slammed him on the floor. When they slammed him on the floor, the one with the box cutter jumped on top of him and just started hacking at him. So he put his hands up to block it. He was trying to block from getting hit in his face. And that's what caused his hands to get cut. And they cut the tendons out of his hands. They were cutting through him. Now they had a real box cutter blade. It wasn't obviously like this. It was just a blade out by itself, but they had a real box cutter blade. Because we were at the work camp, a lot of the people that went on our work squads had access to different tools, and these tools would get snuck back in and turned into weapons. So it was a real blade, a real box cutter blade. What makes these box cutters more dangerous then your average razor is how thick they are. Or not thick, but how wide. So the wider it is, the deeper it can go. And, you know, there were kids at Lancaster getting hit with box cutters where their cheek would detach. It would be split. Or it would come up and go down and their cheek would flip over. And you could see all their teeth in their mouth. They would have to hold their face together or hold it shut because of how opened up their faces. It was bad. Box cutters took it to a whole nother level when it came to cutting. You can do damage with a razor, but a box cutter just, it really messes people up to the point that there was another kid that got hit with a box cutter so bad, the prison is actually paying for the surgery of the removal of his scar. He had a crazy messed up sky on his face. It, it was bad. It, they do a lot, a lot of damage, you know. The muscles in your jaw, all that gets cut through. So they have to reconstruct everything in your mouth. They hit this kid up. Like I said in Death's video, his pinky was split down the middle and hanging off, and it was only attached by veins. Like, it was just dangling off. So, you know, he ran over to the CO's. They see what happens to him. He gets put into confinement. They, as far as getting the kids that did this, they just rounded up a whole bunch of random people. You know what I mean? The word was because of how damaged this kid was, they were going to press outside charges and they were going to try to get the kids that did this on attempted murder charges. It was insane. 
You know what I mean? I'm going to touch back on this in a few minutes because what happens after this actually leads back to me seeing this kid again and running into him. But it's, it's just crazy. You just got to listen. So after he got hit up, you know, about a week went by and we get new people at the work camp. This kid comes in the eye dorm that I knew. We were at CFRC together, which is the Central Florida Reception Center. So when I got shipped from Sumter and went to CFRC, that's when I met this kid. He was a blood from Orlando. And when, he, when I went in there, he was like running it. You know what I mean? Like he was the main voice of the dorm. People respected him and they did what he said. You know what I mean? Not that there was a lot of bloods, but he just carried himself that way. He was dominant amongst everyone else. So he comes in the eye dorm, he gets situated, whatever, and, you know, I go up and talk to him. He's acting funny. He's acting, you know, a little bit quieter, a little bit more timid. Not really soft or nothing like that, but he just wasn't as aggressively dominant as he was at CFIC. A lot of people are like that, though. The reception center is completely different from a real prison. When you hit the prisons and you know people are really getting ripped out here, all that tough guy talk goes out the window, really, unless you're willing to do what they do. So we're talking, and he tells me, he's like, you know, I'm going to fall back off that blood stuff, and I'm just going to rock with my home team. Being that he was from Orlando, he wanted to rock with the X-Men. When he said that, my stomach turned. I, I, I couldn't understand it. like. The thing is that a lot of people, you know, that I want a lot of people to understand watching this video is where I lived at in Tampa, Florida, it was pretty much only Bloods, Kings, and NPR, which was Sevens. No one else really existed. There was, you know, there might have been a time where a couple of random whatevers would come, maybe in high school or something like that, but it was pretty much that was it. Those were the three main groups that were in Tampa. And we didn't have too many outside issues. If we had issues, it would be amongst ourselves. When we hit Lancaster, Bloods was not the gang to be. We were at war nonstop from the second I got there with a lot of different groups that clicked up just to go against us. We weren't the gang to be in. So if you were going to stand on your own as a blood, you knew what came with it. And at the work camp, you know, there was a time when I noticed every blood at the work camp had a scar on their face from getting cut. There was probably like 15 of us. Every single one of us had been cut, still banging. You know what I mean? We done did things to other people too, but all of us had been hit up before, if not multiple times. So when he told me that he didn't want to bang anymore, I took it as he isn't willing to go to war. He isn't willing to wear a sky like we wear a sky. And I wear mine like a stripe. Like I earned it. I went to war. I shed my blood for blood. That's what it is. I shed my blood for those that have shed blood for me. That's what I'm supposed to do. So when he said that, you know, it was kind of like a final straw for me. I already dealt with the other guy in the other dorm that was saying he was blood but didn't know nothing and he's gambling everybody. And we told him, like, hey, that ain't what it is. And he said, all right, I'm not going to do nothing until I get out. You know what I mean? That We just de-escalated that. This situation here, I didn't bring in anybody else. I didn't ask any other blood on the compound. I didn't ask anyone. I didn't need to ask permission, period, for anything. But I didn't ask anyone to do this with me. I didn't ask anything. You know, I felt like this was a personal thing. I personally met you at a different spot, and you were on a totally different vibe. And then now that we meet up at this spot, you're saying that you don't want to rock with me. So if you see me get hit up, you're not going to help. That's crazy to me. So I'm more or less just, you know, go back to my little area and I'm hanging out with my people that's in there. And um, 
Later that night, I'm in the day room, sitting on the bench and watching TV. He comes and he sits next to me and he taps my knee. Like, ba ba ba. You know what I mean? Like, with a little bit of force. He's like, hey, bro, this is my bench, bro. People play a lot in prison, especially when you're in the younger dorms. People will play with you and, you know, just genuinely play, play around. But because of what he had told me a couple of hours ago, I wasn't playing with him. So I looked at him and I just got up and walked away. And he kind of looked at me like, you know, what's wrong with him? Why is he why is he tripping like that? You know what I mean? We used to play around at CFRC. We were cool. So I could tell about, you know, his his reaction that he knew I wasn't I wasn't trying to be friendly like that. And um at that point, you know, I felt like you just told me you don't want to bang with me, but now you're still trying to be friendly. It's like you're playing with me. Like, you don't think I'm going to do anything. So what I ended up doing is I knew a Latin king from the Bronx. That was my dog. He knew a lot of bloods from New York, obviously. He's from the Bronx. And um, I stepped to him and I said, what's up? You guys got a razor? He said, yeah, I got, I got a razor. Mind you, this is... Lancaster CI. So at Lancaster, it's a site camp. They do not issue state razors. So if anyone has a razor, it's because they got shipped here and they snuck it in. A lot of these razors don't even go off in the metal detectors. Box cutters do, but state razors don't. They're too thin. So he tells me, you know, one of his people, another Spanish kid, got a razor and I wasn't going to get charged for it. When you're at a prison that there's no razors, it can go $50 for just one razor. They weren't going to charge me. They, you know, they respected more or less my reasoning behind what I was going to do. And even if they didn't respect it, they sure as hell wanted to see it happen. So I get the razor. I get the razor and I step to a white boy. Now, this white boy in particular, he wasn't a jizzle. He wasn't affiliated with anything racist, but he was white. He carried himself, you know, as a man. He demanded respect. He had been TOH'd. He passed with flying colors. I asked him, you know, can you tie this up for me? Because I knew eyes were on me already. If I'm tying it up, someone's going to see me tying this up. We tried to do it, but people were already kind of watching. Mind you, this is an open bay dorm. Everyone can see each other. So me being me and not really caring at this point, I went over to my bunk, threw a blanket over my head, and tied the razor up. So how these things look is this is a normal state razor. There's a razor blade inside of there. You pop it out. When you pop it out, this is what the razor looks like. Very, 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 very thin. Now, these are very easy to hide. You put it up in your mouth, you're good to go. You can, you can smile. I've ate with razors in my mouth before. I could leave this razor in my mouth for the rest of this little, you know what I mean, this video. So more or less, what you do with the razor, you can take it out. You can try to hit somebody. What you do is you get a pencil. I didn't have a number two pencil, so I had to get one of the pencils I draw with. You take the end of the pencil where the eraser is and you would shave that down and you would tie the razors on. What I did is I had heard a rumor. When you take a razor like this and you break it in half, now you have two pieces. If you tie the two pieces onto a pencil and cut someone because the cuts are so close, they can't stitch them properly. And what ends up happening is they even they get a worse scar. It's, you're really trying to mock someone at that point when you do it with two razors because it, you know that they're not going to be able to heal correctly. You know what I mean? It's not going to be like a regular cut where they glue it or they stitch it up. This one here, you do a little bit more damage with it. So that's what I did. I broke it in half. I tied it on, and it looked like this. You can see that. There's two razor blades. You can see down the middle. Tied onto the pencil. Obviously, I didn't have red string in there, but uh, you could take the string from your mattress. You could take the string from a shirt, any type of string. You tie it on. You put your fingers on the dull side, 
you put it at an angle and you do what you do. You know what I mean? So what ended up happening is the very next morning, we go to breakfast at like 5.30. So we all line up outside of our dorm. I had everything planned out already. You know, I talked to uh, the Latin King from the Bronx. He helped me out. What ended up happening is we go to breakfast. I can barely eat because I had that sick feeling in my stomach again, as I did when I cut the first kid at something CI. It's just a, it's a, it's a going to war feeling. You know what I mean? You, you, you're not human if you don't feel fear, but it's what you do with it that matters. You know what I mean? If you push through it. And so I got this feeling in my stomach. I can barely eat my food. And I'm just looking at this kid the whole time. And I can tell he's kind of looking at me, but he's really not. He seems comfortable. So when we go back to the dorm, we got to line up outside of the dorm. One line. One person being at the front, and it goes all the way to the back. The CO is the first person to go inside, and she just goes right into the bubble. This specific CO was very, like, ditzy, like she wasn't on point. It was like the perfect opportunity to try to do something like this. So she goes in. The biggest Latin king in the dorm is standing at the door, ready. I'm all the way in the back of the line, and he's maybe eight people in front of me. I got the white boy that I had try to tie it up by me, and I have the other Latin king from the Bronx. He's by me. When they start going in, I take the razor out from my waistband, attached to the pencil. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. People are going in. Everything's going smooth. He looked back a little bit. He stopped looking back. I went for it. I shot in between a few people. Because once we start going in, the line breaks up. You just have to line up at first. And then, you know, you'll have two, three people walking side by side. I'm going in between people. I took the razor, I grabbed him by the top of his head, squeezed his head, slid the razor from the top of his face to the bottom of his face. So I slid it down, I slid it back again. So I cut him once, twice. He put his hand up, I cut his hand. He tried to move his hand, I got him, hit him again. I tried to hit this kid as many times as I could with this razor. Mind you, every time I'm cutting him, it's cutting him twice because there's two razor blades attached to this. I'm hitting him, I'm hitting him, I'm hitting him. Now he's fully balled up blocking it. I shoot off to the, to the door. I run up to the door. After I get through the door, because I already had this plan, the Latin King steps in front of the door so that the kid that I just cut can't run in here and try to fight and the CO sees it because then I will go to confinement for cutting him. So I come in. I run up to the toilets, I break the pencil in half, throw it in the toilet, flush it, the weapon's gone. I walk over to the corner of the day room, I grab the broomstick. Now this is a big broomstick, like the janitor broom, so you can actually hit people with these. I pretend to start sweeping, so that if he comes to me, I'm just gonna start smacking him with the broomstick, you know what I mean? He didn't even react like that at all. He went in the bathroom, he's holding his face, he's trying to wash the blood off. Um, everybody in the dorm is like, you know, what just happened? What did he just do? Like I said, I didn't tell anybody except for the Latin King and the white boy. I didn't tell anyone from Tampa. I didn't tell any of my bloods. None of that. I just went for it because I knew if I told someone, they were going to be like, bro, you don't have to do that. If anything, fight them. And I just, I wanted to, I wanted to, you know send a message more or less like i'm not going for this all these fake gang bangers and this and that it was just like another kid trying to fit in that really didn't fit in and only wanted to bang when it was convenient so i hit this kid up he's on the other side of the dorm i'm on this side and um it's count time so we got to sit down for count i don't know what's going on with him if he's just sitting there bleeding the whole time or but what's going to happen? Is he going to check in? The CO does count and doesn't notice anything. So I guess he, he covered himself up somehow, whatever he did. He was in the bathroom for a minute, you know, wiping himself up and holding it down or whatever. So we do count time, but we got to sit on the bunk for like another hour. After that hour passes, the CO comes to my side of the dorm 
and says my name. I'm thinking to myself, dang, I just got told on. You know what I mean? I, mu I must have just got told on. She tells me to pack it up. I'm confused. You know, I'm wondering why she's telling me to pack it up. But then I remembered. So a couple of weeks back, I had put in a psych request that I wanted to get put back on psych medication. I didn't want to be at the work camp anymore because I felt guilty. I was tired of being around these people. I was tired of being around this environment. It was a lot softer. People that wouldn't be able to speak on the main unit spoke over here with confidence. I thought it was really fake. And I felt guilt every time I heard one of my people got hit up on the main unit and I wasn't there. You know what I mean? These are people I know from the street. Like, I hear my buddy just got, you know, poked up or this one just got cut. This one just got fired up with something. And I'm not there. I'm not riding out with these boys. You know what I mean? It's like we're all in the army, but I'm the only one not going to war. It didn't sit well with me. I'm real loyal. And it didn't sit well. So I put in a psych request to specifically go back to the main unit. It just turns out the day I cut this kid is the day I go back to the main unit. So I never found out what happened to this kid. If he checked PC, if he just went under investigation for the cutting and they stitched him up, I don't know what happened. He didn't do nothing to me. The only other two kids from Orlando in the dorm were soft and they didn't have any weapons. So he didn't have anything to get. I don't know what happened to him. I know I cut this kid up. And I got moved out the same day, so it was perfect. It's like I got away with it, you know what I mean? But I didn't. Calm is real. I got moved back into B dorm, into B1. I think I was in there for maybe a day or two before I got fired up with a brick. And that was the story that I told in, um, I believe, part one. But the Zoe crashed me out with the brick and busted the back of my head open. And, um, yeah, so calm is real. After I went to confinement for getting fired up, I went under investigation, you know, the COs came in and they saw the back of my head. It had a hole. I had to go to medical and get it sewed up. That's also when they beat my brother and the other Haitian kid into the ground. Um, I get put in confinement. My first night in confinement, I go to take a shower. You know, they take me and my, my cellmate out of the cell. We go to the showers and they put my cellmate in the shower first, so I'm standing outside, and I have a cell to my right. And I hear someone say something disrespectful, you know. He says something that's disrespectful towards Bloods. And I turn, and it's the kid from Broward. All this is, you know, he's got staples in his face, stitches, mangled. This kid is just mutilated, the ugliest looking sky. And he's talking crazy. Mind you, he used to be super friendly in the dorm. Come to find out the same kids that they were trying to charge with attempted murder finessed this kid and told him, hey, if you don't tell, you're certified, you're, you're a result. You know what I mean? You're ZMF. The case didn't go anywhere. Nobody got charged with nothing. Nobody got, the charges weren't even filed. It didn't go anywhere. You know what I mean? But this is a kid that wanted to fit in with his own race. This is a gang within their race. He wanted to fit in with his own race so bad. He tried to fake it. Got hit up with a box cutter to the point that he's, he, he's never going to be the same. He can't use his hands. And then not only that, they finessed him in the end into thinking he was one of them, just so he wouldn't tell. That's what I want y'all to learn from this. You know what I mean? Someone that just wanted to fit in, bro. And it turned out like that. It's just, it's crazy. It was crazy witnessing it. It was crazy that he truly believed he was that now that his initiation was getting his face ripped open. 
it was insane, but it's a prison reality. You know what I mean? Now, as far as box cutters go, I had someone hit me up saying, you know, how do you make a box cutter out of a battery? Well, you get a double A battery, just like this one here. What you do is you strip it of the wrapping, you take each end off, and I left that black stuff in it. That's the battery acid. I left it in there just so you can see it. But what you would do is you would clean it out completely and then flatten this. You beat it down flat with a lock. You grind it until one end of it opens up. You peel it open. When you peel it open, take a bit, fold it over, making it sturdier. Once it's sturdy, you take a toilet paper roll, which anybody can get. You wrap it around the blade. You would take sheet. Now, I didn't use sheet. I use rubber bands because I'm not tearing up my sheets for YouTube. I'm not getting paid off of YouTube yet. But I use rubber bands. And this is what a prison box cutter made out of a battery would look like. So you would fold this end over, making it very sturdy. And this is the piece that you would get cut with. And I mean, if you compare this to the razor, this is this will do a lot more damage than this will, even though this is sharper. And that's another reason it does more damage. This is so sharp, it makes a surgical cut. It's a clean cut versus this. You have to sharpen yourself. So steel will sharpen steel. I'm not sure if this is even made out of steel. It's probably aluminum. But you're sharpening it up off of the toilet seats, concrete, anything like that. The blades can be jagged. They're not straight. They're not perfectly straight. So all that has an effect on how the cut comes out you know what i mean but that would be your prison box cutter just like that kid got hit up but he got hit up with a real one from what i heard the co's actually found the box cutter on the rec yard and then this would be your double razor blade now not everybody does doubles most people just put one you can burn them into uh toothbrushes and plastic so the razor really doesn't move but because we're in an open bay dorm, if we're going to burn something like that, everyone's going to know what we're doing. Because it's not going to smell like smoke. It's going to smell like plastic. They're going to know you're making a weapon. So because we were in open bay dorms, we just had to tie it onto a pencil. You know what I mean? But it's just, I don't know, bro. I, I, I didn't have to take it where I took it to, but I was just, I was fed up with it. I was fed up with everyone not being authentic and it's it's the same thing that the zoos felt you know what i mean this kid was trying to false claim it they hit him up in my case this kid just didn't want to bang it because he didn't feel safe banging it he wanted to bang something else he knew was safe so i hit him up do i feel bad about it i had someone um asking me do i feel remorse for the things i did in prison yes and no do I feel remorse for the people I extorted in prison? Yes, because I wouldn't have did it if I had something to eat. I wouldn't have. Later on in my bid, I actually started getting money, and I stopped all of that. I would only do it if one of my people were the ones trying to do it, but I wouldn't initiate it how I used to initiate it. That I do feel bad for because we, you know, it doesn't feel good to take advantage of people like that. You know what I mean? You don't know how that person's family struggling on the outside just to send him $50, $100. And it is what it is, but I don't dwell on it. I don't think about it. And I don't, I can't change it. I can't change what I did. What I don't feel bad for, the kid that I cut. I don't feel bad for him because we were getting hit up on a daily basis. We were hitting people up on a daily basis. He would have left prison without a mark on his face and acted as if he was banging the whole way through, which isn't the case, you know what I mean? And situations like that where people fake it, you know, they can come back to you. I knew someone inside a prison that was banging one specific gang and he was about it 110 percent everyone knew it he was fighting he was hitting people up and when he got out he got killed within 60 days 
Come to find out, he was originally banging a different gang. And it caught up with him. When he came into prison, he found out that that gang wasn't the one to be in. He joined a different one, and when he got out, he got killed. He didn't get killed by the original gang either. He got killed by the new one that he joined. They found out what he was, and that's what happened to him. So, I mean, I hope that some of y'all can learn from this. Some of y'all that aren't, you know, 110% into this to avoid this, avoid this route. And it's just crazy how, how things turn out inside of prison and how far things can go, you know, over the littlest things. But, hey, I just wanted to show y'all just so y'all could really visualize what these crazy little things look like, how crazy it is using them, raising the mouth like it ain't nothing, you know what I mean? And definitely got more to come. So I hope y'all enjoyed this video. If you like it, like it. You're going to rock with me. Subscribe. Until next time.